All right, so um, just gonna give it a few seconds while we wait for people to come in. Um, all right, but I hope everyone's having- All right, so um, just uh, gonna give it a few, a few seconds while we wait for mm. all right um okay so hi everyone and my name is isa and i am a bookseller at politics and prose bookstore and i'd like to welcome all of you to pnp live thank you for joining us tonight from your homes or wherever you're catching this amazing panel um, tonight, we'll be talking about The World as We Knew It, Dispatches from a Changing Climate, an anthology of essays from 19 leading literary writers from around the globe who offer timely, haunting first-person reflections on how climate change has altered their lives. At any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase The World as We Knew It on the Politics and Prose website. And additionally, you can ask our guests a question by clicking on Q&A, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. And while we'll try to get to everyone's questions, we apologize in advance if we can't um, get to yours. And finally, we want to thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we're so thankful to our politics and prose community for keeping our spirits afloat during these unprecedented times. So it is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Um, we have with us um, Taja Eisen and Amy Brady, the anthology editors. Taja Eisen is the author of Some of My Best Friends, Essays on Lip Service. She's the editor-in-chief of Catapult Magazine and the former digital editor at The Walrus, also a voice actor. Taja can be heard on such animated shows as The Berenstein Bears, Atomic Betty, and Go Dog Go, among others. Amy Brady is the executive director of Orion, and she's also the author of A Cultural History of Ice in America and the former editor-in-chief of the Chicago Review of Books. She holds a PhD in literature from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and has won writing and research awards from the National Science Foundation, the Breadloaf Environmental Writers Conference and the Library of Congress. They will be joined by two of the anthology's contributors, Lydia Millet and Omar El Akkad. Lydia has written more, Lydia Millet has written more than a dozen books of literary fiction, including a children's Bible. Her next novel, Dinosaurs, will be published in October. She lives in Tucson, Arizona, where she works as editor and writer at the Center for Biological Diversity, an organization dedicated to fighting climate change and species extinction. Omar El Akkad is an author and journalist. His work earned a National Newspaper Award for Investigative Journalism and the Goff Penny Award for Young Journalists. His fiction and nonfiction has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, Guernica, GQ, and many other newspapers and magazines. His newest novel, What Strange Paradise, won the Giller Prize, the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Award, and the Oregon Book Award for Fiction. Everyone, please join me in welcoming these esteemed writers to PNP Live. Thank you so much, Isa, for that generous introduction. Um, thank you, Lydia and Omar, for uh, contributing to this uh, anthology. We couldn't be happier that, uh, and more honored, really, that you gave us your writing for this book. And thank you, of course, for taking time out of your days for being here. And thank you, everyone, for being here um, to talk about this book um, and to support politics and prose, which I lived for a year once in Washington, D.C., and they are uh, an incredible bookstore and deserve all of your support. Um, and Taja, of course, any opportunity to do anything with you. It's good to see you. Thank you. It's great to be here. I uh, wasn't, we can't see the participants or see evidence of their <laughs> presence. So please, um, as proof that you are there, feel free to send us questions in the chat or the, in the Q&A function at any time, uh, because we would, um, you know, just be delighted to know what uh, questions this book raises for you. And yes, thank you for being here. This is really exciting. Yeah. So what we thought we would do today is Taja and I will give just a very brief overview of this book to give the conversation today some context. And then we want to dive in um, in a conversation with Lydia and Omar about their beautiful essays for this book. 
So I guess I'll start out by saying that The World as We Knew It is an anthology of personal essays about the contributors' experiences with the climate crisis. And it began uh, just a few years ago when um, uh, I noticed that there wasn't in the climate of literature, excuse me, the literature of climate, that there weren't a lot of writing about those personal experiences. You know, most reportage about the, the climate crisis uh, takes a macro scale perspective about how, um, you know, wildfires and hurricanes and uh, flooded coastlines are impacting communities. And for good reason, because those things impact millions and millions of people. But less often captured in the literature of climate is how the crisis was affecting people at the level of an individual life, um, you know, how it affects our relationships, our jobs, our own backyards, our memories, our daydreams. And that's the scale at which this anthology um, uses as its launching point. And um, yeah, we just couldn't be happier that uh, Lydia and Omar were a part of it. Um, once the idea for the anthology came to be, I knew immediately I needed a co-editor and I knew exactly who that co-editor should be. Uh, Taja, who um, has edited me in the past, and I knew her to be one of the smartest editors uh, I've ever met with um, impeccable instincts and much to my delight and privilege, she said yes. So that's, that's kind of the origin story of the book. Um, Taja, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, sure. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, I guess just to say that one of the things that really excited me about the project when Amy approached me um, was the opportunity to uh, broaden the conversation around climate writing. Um, I wasn't somebody who felt like that was a space that I had an easy sort of access point into. Um, I also came to it as uh, primarily understanding it as a you know very science-based conversation, very facts and figures based conversation. And the idea that um, you know our literary writers, um, you know, that that could be climate writing too was was really exciting to me and um, is one of the most powerful things that I think this book does and that it sort of brings into the conversation um, voices that we haven't necessarily seen on these subjects before. Um, so looking forward to hearing more from Omar and Lydia about their contributions. Yeah, well, let's um, let's go ahead and dive in. And also for the folks tuning in, um, please put your questions in the chat box. We will get to those, uh, as many of them as we possibly can after we, we have a little conversation here. Um, Taja, do you wanna start? Let's do it. Um, so this uh, this question is for both uh, both Lydia and Omar. Um, just sort of taking a, a broad look at uh, at your careers, at your writing. Um, can you speak a bit to what sparked your interest and attention to writing about the climate crisis in the first place? I guess I can start unless Omar wants to, um, you know, I don't love to start, but I will start. Uh, so, I mean, for me, it's sort of now the backdrop of everything. And so it's hard to avoid writing about it, but I had sort of come to matters of climate through matters of extinction, which, um, which, had always been my fixation and um, sort of heartbreak. And uh, of course there's, you know, there's a sort of Venn diagram there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, overlap between the climate and extinction crises. Uh, but there's also places where they diverge and where they even perhaps solutions conflict in certain cases. Um, and so I'd always, sort of written about animals, but I um, was reluctant to write about climate or not reluctant, but I just, you know, it presents such a massive abstract sort of armature of, um, of really boring stuff uh, <laughs> as well as just um, science that's difficult to write about in, in an artistic context uh, without coming off didactic or pedantic or um, polemic. And, uh, and so really, um, actually, I think the first time I wrote fiction about climate was actually a young adult book that I wrote that no one has read um, <laughs> called uh, Pills and Starships. 
And then after that, which was a sort of dystopian speculative thing, although I feel quite realistic in its, in its projections um, about a sort of future world under, um, under climate change. And then so A Children's Bible was the first book where I didn't just write about sort of um, the animal and plant side, the sort of extinction side of the future, but, um, but also this amorphous place of dread that we all now know as climate, as climate change. So, so for me, it, it's been something um, that's everywhere um, for, I don't know, for all my adult life, for sure, and um, some of my childhood, and couldn't finally be avoided. I think, anyway, I'll hand it over to Omar. The unavoid, this just sort of an unavoidable, um, an unavoidable sort of elephant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, th thank you, first of all, for doing this, uh, Amy and Taj. I appreciate it. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and, and to continue my impeccable streak of being the least impressive person on every panel that I'm on. <laughs> Uh, even by my standards, this is, this is, there's some real asymmetry going on here. Um, I, I was thinking about this earlier about, because it, it runs through in various forms, everything I've written in fiction and a lot of my journalism. And I think I first started writing specifically about climate change as, as a journalist. Um, a lot of the stories that I pitched to my old newspaper uh, particularly once I got to the U.S. I was a U.S. correspondent for a Canadian newspaper for a while for the last few years of my journalism career, which is a strange place to be because you're explaining the United States to people who are very close to the United States but aren't in the United States. And so it's, it's an odd frame of reference. But um, I was down in southernmost Louisiana doing a story about land loss, and the, the rate of land loss in southernmost Louisiana, which last time I checked was something like a football field every 45 minutes or something something sort of wild and, and fictional sounding. Um, and it was there when I, I had started sketching this novel called American War and I didn't know where I was gonna start it. And as soon as I got there, I realized that this had to be the place um, because it was this book that was so concerned with inverting things that America had done in the world. And here was something where the world was doing something to America. And so I, it seemed like a fitting, fitting uh, place. But I think for me, it comes down to, in addition to everything Lydia said, which is spot on, I, I think, um, the notion of uncertainty uh, playing a real role in my writing life and my sense of identity for as far back as I can remember. Um, I'm one of those people who doesn't have a very good answer to the question, where are you from? And I was born in Egypt, but I, my dad had to get the hell out when I was five. So we left when I was five. I grew up in Qatar. I'm a citizen of Canada and the US now. Um, I don't have much of a root system geographically. And so I've always had this sense of being on uneven ground and it's reflected in all of my writing. And so when I think of climate change, that uncertainty immediately kicks in. And in a weird way, it feels like home from a writing perspective because I'm, I'm not used to stable ground generally when I'm writing. Um, the other aspect for, for me is this notion of you know, when I think of the sort of canonical mid 20th century literary advice, um, the Hemingways of the world, the sort of like iceberg principle, keep it to yourself, so on and so forth. A lot of that stuff is really great when you've had the Victorians yelling on your behalf for a really long time, you can afford to sort of keep it that way. Uh, and if you don't, then you have to do some yelling. And so when I write in this mode, I am in a little way thinking about being some future generations Victorians. Um, and so for me, those two avenues are, are the way that I think about framing climate as, as something to write about in fiction, that uncertainty and that sense of obligation to what hopefully some future generation of writers are not going to have to say. Whether I get either of this stuff right is, is entirely a separate question, but that's sort of the way I'm thinking about it when I put it together. I love that so much, writing about climate as shaping the, the future and the future history of the novel. It's, the, the, it's, it's a very sort of audacious and, and problem way to think about it, but it, and it also probably fails in almost every respect of, of trying to frame it in, in a non-abstract way. Um, but it does relate 
to sort of culturally as well, because I write, I write from this weird overlap of, of my Middle Eastern heritage and having grown up on Western culture. And so there is this notion of, of what is someone else who comes along who has the same overlap going to have as any kind of basis. Um, it doesn't mean that anything I do is good enough to be that basis, but it does mean that it, I'm thinking on those terms, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm. Thank you. That's that's a great segue into uh, our next question for you both, because, um, you know, in your fiction, Omar, um, and in yours, Lydia, there is such a strong sense of place. And in both of your essays, there's such a strong sense of place that, um, you know, really just, I think, adds to the emotional power of uh, of your storytelling. And so for folks who haven't picked up the book yet, would both of you describe the places that you write about in your essays for this book and talk about why you decided to focus on those places? Um, so, well, it's interesting that you say that my fiction has a strong sense of place because I've always felt it was sort of placeless. <laughs> Actually, I mean, I sort of situate it in Los Angeles often or other places I don't currently live that seem uh, archetypal to me in various ways that are interesting and fun to play with and whatever. And I've always thought, oh, I'll never be one of those descriptive writers, Uh, you know, like people who writers who um, there's so much sort of textural detail around sites and locations and whatever. I've just always felt I would not number uh, in their legion. So anyway, it's really interesting that you say that. This particular essay was, is sort of site specific and um, uh, just has to do with my my home um, in, uh, in the desert outside Tucson, which is a home that I, as I say in the piece, you know, sort of desperately love and I'm desperately afraid of losing. Uh, and I usually don't write about it, frankly, in fiction. I don't write about it because I don't know. It's almost, it's actually sort of a maybe pathological on my part that I don't write about it more. But I have always felt that to write about the desert outside Tucson directly in my fiction would be like writing about myself directly in my fiction or something. I've always just, you know, I'm not... I've never been comfortable writing directly about myself, um, which I'm sure many fiction writers can identify with. It's why we write, you know, these alleged lies uh, instead of attempting to be journalists of of prose in some way. Um, but so I've always I've always avoided it. And for this particular essay, I had to write about it, um, both because you asked me to and because there's this sort of imminent threat to that world Um, uh, and a threat. Let me just turn this phone off. So annoying. Um, A threat that I sort of, uh, basically it's the threat of of, of an interstate being driven, being sort of built through the the valley where I live. Uh, uh, And um, there's also a climate threat that is, that has always been there. And that, you know, as we, as we all know, we're going through this, this great drought, this mega drought in, um, in the West and in the Southwest that the likes of which haven't been seen for, what is it, 1200 years, 1600, 1400, it's like a really long time. Uh, this drought that we're seeing and that is now being exacerbated by, by climate change. Uh, so that's always, always the backdrop of the desert and um, other people, you know, I moved there from New York and I'll, I'll stop blathering soon, but I moved there from New York like almost a quarter century ago. And um, because I loved the landscape and, um, and all of us who've lived there that long or longer really feel like we're seeing, or at least all the people I know who think about the desert and love the desert really have felt that we're seeing this slow decline of that desert that we love of so many of the things that live in it. Um, And then there's this, there's this more proximate threat that I was also writing about of this, of this freeway being built through it. So there's things we can help and there's things we can't help individually. And I sort of was writing about both of those different scales of um, 
perceived helplessness and um, and possible action. Anyway, I think I've said enough and I want to hear Omar. Um, I also wrote about a desert uh, on the other side of the planet. I, um, I spent my formative years sort of five to 16 uh, in a place called Qatar, which is this little peninsula sticking out of Saudi Arabia. Um, it's become famous now because they're about to hold the, the World Cup, I think, this year uh, in what will almost certainly be just a disaster. But um, and that's neither here nor there. Qatar is pound for pound probably the richest place on Earth. Um, a few decades ago, they stumbled onto the, I think, third largest natural gas reserves in the world or something like that. And so per capita, this place is, is incredibly, incredibly rich. Uh, in absolute terms, it's also incredibly rich. It's also 90% non qatari uh, 90% of the population has come in from somewhere else to cash in on the oil and gas money. And um, it's... I, I was I was thinking a little bit about um, the idea of how future centered a lot of climate writing is, and the reasons for that. I think one is because, at least from my mode of writing, you have a bag of tricks. You know, Jorge Luis Borges has always talked about the idea that literature is just a bunch of tricks, and no matter how clever you are, your tricks eventually get discovered. My tricks are not particularly clever. One of them is, is extrapolation, and when you're extrapolating particularly with respect to the climate, you set it in the future and you sort of move that way. But I think the other part of it is that the future is, um, in an abstract sense, always a democratic place, it hasn't arrived yet. Uh, and so even though in reality, people are mortgaging the hell out of the future with almost every societal decision we make, we mortgage the hell out of the future. It's still in an abstract sense yet to come and so is open to all kinds of possibility. And I wanted to look in the other direction um, because Qatar, as I, knew, as I knew it, doesn't exist anymore. The places where I grew up, I grew up in this dinky little apartment complex called uh, El Dafna, which um, literally translated means the place that, that has been graveyarded. It's an infill. They, they buried the sea to build this thing. And that's where I learned to ride a bike and all the rest of it. And none of that exists anymore. It's now like a Four Seasons and a bunch of towers, a bunch of skyscrapers. So on a micro level, I think a lot of people have that experience. You know, <clears throat> you show up to your old playground and it's been converted into condos or whatever. But at a macro level, Qatar itself as an entity, as a livable entity, by the end of my lifetime will probably cease to exist. It'll be too hot to live there. And so I tried to write this essay, and I think, I, I don't mean this as self-criticism, but I think I failed in almost every respect to, to come to any kind of conclusion about it. But I was thinking about this idea of what happens when a very future-minded species is faced with a crisis that is also sneaking around them and, and sort of messing with their memory bank. Um, and I'm fascinated with that. And so that's, that's what I tried to write about. I think you succeeded wildly, <laughs> Omar. Your essay absolutely captures that, that sense of looking back, that sense of loss, that sense of, um, you know, what happens to a person living in the present when the memories of their childhood have been, well, the memories are there, but the place that is in those memories have essentially been erased. Um, it's a very powerful essay and we are very lucky to have it in the collection. Um, you know, it's so core to the, you know, the, the direction that the book is looking into. Um, and so I, all right, all right, my next question is kind of, um, I mean, it's also about relationship to place and the places that you both write about in your respective essays, but, um, I'm interested in the time, not just the time that you're writing about, but more so the time since you have written the essay, um, since you did capture that moment, um, or since the time since the moment of writing, um, since then, how has your relationship to those respective places changed since the act of writing? Um, 
you can answer. Uh, I, I don't mean to keep putting you on the spot first, Lydia. <laughs> you, want, you want to make I it up? Know. I mean, well, the honest answer is I don't think it really has changed. I mean, the, I feel like my my love for this particular desert, the Sonoran Desert, is just this abiding sort of principle in my life, and um, I I don't know. I I feel heartbreak all the time about that desert. And I mean, there's, there's, um, I guess one thing I could say is that the, the organization I work for has recently filed suit to try to stop, for example, that specifically that interstate um, development. And so that made me very happy. That was a, <laughs> because I didn't know if we would, and it wasn't fully within my power. And I also don't know how that will, um, resolve itself of course but um that was just a action you know action is hope and um and so to see that action take place and to be involved with it have um have encouraged me in in that small thing that small matter of building an interstate through a valley that's like not only full of animals and um and plants that are kind of extraordinary and delicate and fragile as desert organisms typically are but also like a place of history, because this this particular valley, as I think I wrote in the essay, um, is home to maybe ten thousand petroglyphs, or so, uh, many of which are not are, have not been really fully documented or studied or whatever. So there's a whole cultural history. It's the most sort of it's the longest continually continually inhabited place supposedly in the in the um, in the United States. Uh, by by people so folks have lived there for a really long time even though it's so um to the to the naked eye so inhospitable compared to the temperate place that uh, for example i find myself in now which is which is um, maine um yeah so but but essentially my love for this place never changes and never wavers and i um you know i'm just always in this state of, um, you know, a vigilance and hope sort of looking out at it and, and what's happening to it and, and how fire, uh, encroaches on parts of it and, um, and other sort of large and amorphous threats. Um, and just looking at the critters that live there, you know, I did want to say one thing about, if I may, Omar's, um, Omar's sort of voice in his piece, which I think is what I love about about his piece actually is this that he's sort of the this ghost. He's sort of this ghost um, speaking. This sort of he's speaking from the point of view of the already dead to the next people um, in this piece. To me, to, to some degree, and I really love how he does that. I know this isn't exactly answering your question, but that was what I sort of loved about his piece because all all the best literature really is dead people talking, right? And and his piece has this really imminent feel of a dead person talking. Omar, do you know what I'm do you know what I'm saying? Does that does that sound insane to you? Oh, I mean, first of all, thank you very much. I um uh, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to keep my star struckedness down to a minimum for the duration of this uh uh of this conversation. But the fact that you read the damn thing in the first place is is astounding to me. So thank you. I forget which of the the dead Russian said that the, the purpose of literature is to prepare the soul for death, which is an incredibly morbid way, I think, to think of the entire enterprise, but not, not particularly wrong. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, I think this goes, this goes to the question is this notion of what changed, I guess, and a lot of it has to do with ghosts. Um, uh, not long after I wrote that essay, we had our second child. And three days after we had our second child, we were, we were just back home from the hospital. The wildfires came to Oregon. At the time, it was the largest wildfires in the history of the West. I'm sure that record's been broken since. Um, but we were at the north end of Clackamas County and we're basically on level two evacuation, waiting to find out if the fire would jump the river because 20 minutes south of us, you can still see it. It's entire towns have sort of been obliterated and we can't see to the edge of our backyard and, and, and so on and so forth. And um, we're sitting there with this three day old child with all the air purifiers running in the living room kind of huddled. And it, it got me to thinking about how many of my relationships with place 
are essentially already or in the process of becoming relationships with phantom places. I don't, I don't think our house is going to survive the decade. Like, I don't think that the trajectory of fires in the West being what it is, that that place is going to, is going to make it. Um, I love our house out in the woods in Oregon, but it's, you know, uh, the writings on the wall sort of thing. And so if anything, the way that, that my relationship with place has changed is that I've become a little more comfortable with the idea that I, via memory and via experience, live in a bunch of phantom places. The Qatar that no longer exists, this part of Oregon that may not exist in the same way in the future, and so on and so forth. Um, which is a great thing from a writing perspective, because I spend all of my professional life living in phantom places when I'm writing. Uh, not such a great thing from every other perspective, I think. Um, if I may say so, Lydia, there's also something of kind of a haunting in your essay too, um, where, you know, you are like Omar, you're also looking towards the past in, you know, your essay into, um, you know, who lived there, you know, before you. And um, would you, would you talk just a little bit about like what, both from a craft perspective, but you know, maybe also just from a, a communication perspective, like what you were trying to say about this land by jumping between these two points in time. I'm really bad at talking about craft. So um, keep your expectations very low. Uh, I don't know. I mean, so there's, a, there's actually sort of three levels of, or three moments vague moments in time in this essay, I think, if I recall, which is there's reference to, to, to my, my situation there and those of my contemporaries. And then there's uh, the, the sort of um, legacy of ranching in the Southwest and uh, cattle ranching and what that has done to the landscape, there's a bit of just just sort of reference to cowboy lore and uh, the sort of myth um, of the powerful man of the West um, that still really plays a part in in terrible policy making on <laughs> on federal and state levels. And uh, then then there's also the history of you know of the people who've really been there a long time, um, the Hohokam, now the Tona Odam. Uh, the Pima, the um, the Yaki, all the people who have really known this land uh, and lived lived off this land for a long time without uh, without destroying it um, before uh, white people like myself got there um, and and other and other people too. Obviously, not just white people, but um, there was a whole Mexican America uh, before before Tucson was um, sold to, to, <laughs> to the US. Um, but so there's, there's, there's sort of multiple levels of um, relationship with the land there. I am I'm sort of captivated by certain aspects of, um, you know, the mythology of the, the conqueror West and uh, so, sort of various aesthetic aspects of, the cowboy um, of cowboy country are are appealing to me, even though I actually am quite horrified by you know by what livestock operators have done and continue to do to to the arid west. Um, I also love you know cowboy ballads and <laughs> and um, and sort of the music that's associated with a lot of that culture. And so I, I don't know, I, in everything there's beauty in, in sort of the most destructive systems that we've ever made, there's always, there's always beauty. And, uh, and I guess maybe that's all I was touching on in this, that, you know, always in terribleness, there is also loveliness. And sometimes it's hard to separate one from the other. Mm. 
And the, the title of your essay, From This Valley They Say You Are Leaving, does that, that comes from one of the cowboy ballads that you talk about in the piece, right? Yeah, that actually comes from, I can't remember if I mentioned this in that in, in the article, but um, it's Red River Valley, I think, which is not specifically about Arizona at all. But um, but I I was just reminded of its existence because my daughter went on the school trip to China and they had to sing Red River Valley in Mandarin. <laughs> to perform on her school trip. And it reminded me uh, when I was hearing this like recording of them singing this in Mandarin, just what a beautiful song it is and, and how many beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful songs um, have come out of the West and, um, you know, out of aspects of colonialism actually. Um, I'm curious to ask about the personal essay um, and it's, it's role just in, in climate storytelling, um, because we, it's not something we've, it's not a form that we have seen address the climate crisis, um, until fairly recently, um, it's tended to appear in, in fiction and reportage, um, but the idea of a sort of first person narrative experience of, um, you know, of the lived effects of the climate crisis seems more of a recent phenomenon. So, I would love to know um, what you think the first person essay can tell us about the climate crisis that other genres might not necessarily be able to. Um, I, I was thinking a little bit about this uh, recently because I was writing an essay about um, uh, my father's death. My father died uh, when I was 28 and he was 56. And um, I had sort of avoided the topic uh, for, for a long time. Uh, I just turned 40, so for a fairly long time. Um, and there were the obvious reasons for avoiding it. You know, it's, it's a nerve ending and I'm not particularly, um, you know, gunning for, for poking at the nerve ending. Um, but I was also thinking about the other side of the experience. What one of my actually, what is a reader getting out of this? You know, okay, your dad died, lots of people's dads died. What are you, what are you telling them? What are you, um, and it got me thinking about the idea of the personal essay just, just as a form, which I'm, I'm not particularly uh, good at and I don't, I'm not prolific at, but, but um, I was thinking of why I shy away from it so often. And I think part of it has to do with this obligation to change something. I don't know what it is, but something on the other side of the reading experience. And, and that becomes particularly loud, at least in my head. It shouldn't be, but it is when I'm talking about something related to climate change, because I'm sure you've seen this many, many times where in some review or in some conversation, there's always the sense of like, so how is your personal essay going to personally offset the climate crisis? Like, how are you going to, via this mode of writing, uh, bring down the global temperatures by a degree or two, because that really needs to happen in the next few years. And I think that I was just carrying that around with me a lot. Um, and I'm trying my best to sort of rid myself of that. When I was reading Lydia's essay, I was also reading, uh, researching this thing that I hope will be the new novel and it, and it intersects with wildfires. So I was reading this book about wildfires, a lot of which focused on wildfires in Arizona. And in the context of reading these two texts, I was thinking a little bit about how we've created a society that makes it very, very difficult to mourn. Um, there, there's so little bang for your buck under capitalism and mourning. What, what does it do? But there's immense beauty in mourning. Um, there's catharsis in mourning. There's all of these things that we know at a personal level. Um, and I think that's become the place, the, the, the avenue through which I approach the personal essay is to deliberately avoid the obligations that the kind of society we live in have, have sort of set in my head. Um, I don't care in the slightest if it changes anything. Um, and and if, even if you strip everything away from it, in a documentary sense, there is an import to this. Um, Things are moving faster than they ever have in, in, the, in the time of our species at the very least. And if nothing else, to simply document the moment of being in this incredibly swift current 
is in of itself for me worth the price of admission. But beyond that, I think there's a real beauty to addressing the things that um, are deliberately outside of that system, are deliberately without a kind of commercial value in of themselves, but with an immense emotional value that, that resonates for me anyway. I've been thinking more and more about Morning Two and actually writing about it in nonfiction um, in a book I'm working on too. Uh, but just how I think, you know, this culture, this culture that we find ourselves in, uh, I'm going to say North America in North America, because, you know, I grew up in Canada and, um, and there's some of, some, some of this in Canada too, uh, is that both the U S and Canada partake heavily of this, but this sort of denial of grief and this denial of death and always um, uh, sort of acting as though grief is just something to be got through. Uh, and I think that more and more, even with things like, um, you know, Extinction Rebellion and like um, Lost Species Day, um, and things like that, there is beginning to be this understanding that we have to know better how to mourn. Uh, not, not because we should feel grief because we have loss, but because without mourning, we actually don't, we don't live fully. We don't live fully when we deny grief and we don't admit to the, the sanctity of, of all life sort of, you know, that the beauty of everything that is uh, can't really be fathomed if we refuse to look at loss with, uh, you know, with our hearts to be old fashioned about it. You know, I do, I, I think there's this sort of like false notion floating around in, in culture that um, sadness equates to passivity or that, you know, that, um, uh, the fath the fathoming of of loss and the embrace of grief is somehow passive by necessity, and I think that's absolutely not true. And we need to understand how active grief and mourning can allow us to be, and um, to embrace them as part of our whatever new paradigm we can strive toward that allows us to move, you know, forward. Uh, from this capitalist uh, infinite sort of growth model that's so ravaging uh, the systems that we that support our life. I mean, it's all very obvious, I'm sure what I'm saying, but you know, I, I do really believe that mourning and grief are a huge part of, of this new moment of whatever hope we have in, in, um, in acting against destruction, you know. Well, I think that is a um, powerful note to wrap up this conversation, um, at least as it exists between just me and Taja. Um, I saw that there are some questions coming in. So if anyone else in the uh, audience tonight has questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, quickly, though, before we turn to those, I just want to ask you, Lydia and Omar, um, thank you for writing the essays for this book, but what's next for the both of you creatively so that people can keep their eyes and ears tuned for them? Uh, oh, you go, Omar. <laughs> I Sure, actually, I, this one I'd rather go first because I'm afraid of what you're going to say. Um, and I, uh, I don't want to have to follow it up. Uh, I'm currently at the uh, Queen's University Biological Research Station, which is out in the middle of nowhere, just north of Kingston, Ontario. Um, it's, got, it's a weird, let me see. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Oh. In this oh, I love it. Owls, other raptors? Yeah, there's, I don't know, what, is it a weasel? I'm not even sure. My, my, um, I was the writer in residence for my alma mater last semester and they, um, I couldn't do it in person because of COVID and they felt bad for me. So, I, they gave me a cabin at this place to actually do some writing for a month. I think some biology PhD student has just had a year added on to their research because they got booted out from their rightful cabin so that I could come here and make <laughs> stuff up. Um, but that's sort of what I'm doing. I'm working on the next novel out here in, in the middle of nowhere. I have uh, three and a half pages. I'm, I'm quite proud of myself. So that's, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> 
three and a half great pages, no doubt, no doubt. Um, uh, for myself, so I have a novel coming out uh, called Dinosaurs, as someone said in the in the kindly said in the in the chat over here. Um, but I'm what I'm really working on is this uh, sort of I don't know nonfiction thing that's like part bestiary and part I guess memoir. Although I, I'm really loath to admit it because it, I just feel I feel very uh, narcissistic calling anything a memoir. Uh, which is not to say that memoirs are by nature narcissistic, just that I don't know how to, <laughs> I don't understand my own position in regard to writing something long that has myself in it as a character. So I'm really kind of struggling, but it's mostly about, it's sort of a BC, it's about um, having children uh, in, in the time of extinction and climate change and um, loving those children and what our love for our children could mean for the rest of the beasts and and the green things. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's called um, We Loved It All. Yeah, so that's what I'm that's what I'm struggling most with at the moment. Well, I can't wait to read both of these works. Um, and if I may uh, brag a moment, Lydia, I did read an advanced copy of Dinosaurs and it's amazing. Oh. <laughs> amazing thank you the world is going to love it oh well I hope that's true it's it was such a quiet I just see it as such a quiet book and I, I'm glad that anyone likes it so thank you yeah of course I was really interested in um Therese I was hoping that um that Omar would answer this question from Therese Faboda, who is an excellent writer who also has a really good piece about cougars in the anthology that I just read today and, and uh liked very much as I like everything she writes but um, she says, what part does nostalgia play in writing about the climate disaster, which we've touched on a bit, but specifically the idea of nostalgia is I think really interesting. And Omar, I was hoping you would have something cool to say about that because it obviously is, is part of your project. Um, it's a fascinating question. Yeah, I don't, I, um, I, 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 every time I start, I start a new project, I go back to my favorite lecture series uh, on literature, which is, um, Northrop Fry uh, in the 80s, in the early 80s, had this, gave, taught this course at U of T, University of Toronto, um, called The Bible in English Literature, which was looking, looking at the Bible as a foundational text for so much of the canon and so on and so forth. But one of the things he talks about is this notion of, um, you know, if you're a scholar of Judaism, the Hebrew language is incredibly important. Um, in the Quran, the Quran is so tied with the Arabic language that um, anywhere that Islam went as an empire, the Arabic language followed along. It's how central the Arabic language is to the, to the religious text. But Christianity, almost from, from its earliest days, is a religion in translation. Um, you have the Vulgate, the translation into Latin, and then you have the English versions, uh, versions of course, the, the most famous of which being the King James Bible, but all of them with their, with their minor sort of offsets of individual words almost you know the kingdom of heaven is uh, within you uh, versus the kingdom of heaven is among you and how different an outlook on the notion of, of a social gospel those two minor differences are and i think of that in the context of this moment we're in right now where we're sort of a species in translation and and the thing we're going to become we're going to have to become is uncertain um and so I flip that on its sort of backwards facing axis and that gives me nostalgia, which is a translation of the past. Um, I am fairly certain that's, that one or more of the details in that essay I wrote are almost certainly factually incorrect and are just my recollections of where my first kiss took place. Um, and that that recollection in the context of it mattering really only to me anymore is more important than the factual reality of it. Um, that to me is a really powerful and, and subsequently a very dangerous weapon to wield. And I think we're gonna be wielding it more and more. Um, this notion of what I remember being more important than what was. I think that has immense power for good and evil uh, all at once. That's not a very coherent answer, but that's where I go to when when I think of nostalgia is just how incredibly powerful it is at accomplishing some really beautiful 
and possibly some really horrible things. Because I certainly see that streak in a lot of, there's a streak of, of republicanism and right-wing thought in America that is heavily dependent on nostalgia. And it's a really violent, insidious kind of nostalgia that nonetheless is, is tapping into the same, the same root system. Um, so I'm sort of fascinated and terrified by it all at once. Yeah, yeah, both, yes, agreed. Also, I do think when I think of nostalgia, I, well, in this context, a couple of things, I think of the German word for nostalgia, Sehnsucht, and how like that was always really, I mean, many cultures have interesting words for nostalgia, but I remember this poem that I, that I memorized in college uh, called that by this romantic poet, Eichendorf. And uh, just how, how incredibly evocative it was to me as a kid, um, a kid like by which I mean like an 18 year old or whatever, this, this just sort of um, lovely evocation of uh, looking out a window at a landscape and how that poem sort of for me, even though it's a pretty simple-minded poem, <laughs> it's, not, it's not intellectual or anything at all, um, but it's about just sort of looking into the night and hearing like a, a, a horn sort of call across the silence. And, um, and I was noticing, Omar, there was, I think I was seeing in the background out your windows and maybe I, now I'm not seeing it at all, but there were like green thing. It seemed to me there was like, trees moving in a breeze or something behind you. And uh, that to me is just the ultimate sort of trees moving in a breeze through a window is to me already, already existent nostalgia almost. So this like sort of um, uh, perfectly evoked a deja vu or something of the future. <laughs> I don't know something about breezes and trees and this all sounds very vague but I think we're we're trying to come up with now a language for extinction and climate and people are inventing neologisms you know um either new words or new phrases solastalgia for example you know uh which is coined by an Australian philosopher Glenn Albrecht I think a couple of years or a few years ago um or terms like species aloneness, species loneliness, just a whole new vocabulary of loss that we're coming up with now. Um, some of which resonates and, um, and some of which maybe doesn't for everyone. But I do think, yeah, absolutely. It's this odd, it's this odd double-edged sword, the idea of nostalgia that um, we can sort of assume others that, that similar things are evoked for all of us when we create a piece of art or writing or journalism or something that has, or poem, whatever it might be, visual art, anything that, that somehow to us contains nostalgia, we sort of make all sorts of assumptions about the commonality or universality of that feeling um, when really it can be an extraordinarily pernicious um, difference. What what we what we um, mean when we say nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, I I think in some ways uh, it's kind of a theme throughout this collection. Even if the word nostalgia itself doesn't come up too often, there's this sense of trying to resist. Um, uh, a myth making, I guess, about the past, and to try instead to just be a bit more honest, I guess, um, you know, while at the same time, you know, wrestling with that grief, as you so beautifully put it, um, Lydia, that um, makes us kind of nostalgia in the present, uh, which I think is uh, maybe a motivator for why people want to lean so hard into myth. Um, we, I think we have time quickly to answer just, we have one more question here. It comes from uh, Mandana who uh, asks, is it possible to write about the environment uh, without focusing on the current apocalyptic aspects of it? Are there hopeful, if not happy stories we can still tell? 
Um, that certainly brings up some things for me, but Lydia and Omar <laughs> and Taja. <laughs> Anything you'd like? To well, say? I will. I will say there are always hopeful stories we can tell, and I really just I did not to be simplistic, but um, all stories of action are stories of hope, and all stories of love are stories of hope, right? I mean, hope is tricky. It's it's just a really tricky thing, isn't it? Because some forms of it are um, cop outs, right? Like <laughs> um, if you just sit around hoping, that's really not impressive at all, is it? <laughs> But at the same time, we can't, we're paralyzed without hope. We can do nothing without it, right? It's just like sort of, we're just depressive and suicidal and um, uh, flattened without hope. So of course, we there are forms of hope that we have to have and cherish and um, other forms that really, I think are just people's way of saying uh, that they can sit on their asses and, uh, you know, wait for things to get better or wait for like a more perfect world or uh, wait for someone else to do something, right? So like your definition of hope is, is always important and, and what, what hope means. I think it has to mean and comes from doing and thinking and uh, in some cases writing, but also just really uh, honestly voting <laughs> in certain ways and learning, like really learning and reading and um, admitting information into your into your sphere. I mean, all these are forms of hope. Uh, despair is when we turn our faces away from curiosity and and um, and from other people's information, right? Uh, forms of information or forms of learning or whatever. So, I think. I mean, I think hope is everywhere. We just have to find the hope that moves. Mm. Um, I could try, but I don't think I could have said it any better than Lydia just did. Um, I, Amy, not to put you on the spot, but I'm fascinated with what these thoughts are that you, that you have about, about this particular question. Oh, well, I guess it's just that so often um, I uh, hear people talking about hope and despair um, as if, you know, the range of human experience exists just within that dyad. <laughs> and um, I, you know, I, I think that when writing is done really well, like both of your essays and, um, you know, in both of, you know, your, your fictional works, when you talk about the climate crisis, is that you leave room for the whole spectrum of human response, you know, I mean, nobody goes through their day just feeling one thing, let alone one thing about an issue as all encompassing and large and multifaceted as the climate crisis. Um, and I think that any writing that tries to narrow that spectrum to just one or two emotions does a disservice to the subject and to the reader, because um, it's not really a reflection of what people feel. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you both for <laughs> avoiding that pitfall so beautifully. <laughs> um, well, I, Tasha, um, any, anything else coming from you? I think we're about to wrap up. I guess the one thing I'll add is that I feel like it is a very hopeful collection. Um, I know a phrase that Amy has used a lot in describing this book is bearing witness. Um, and I think to, you know, to keep a record, to acknowledge that, you know, there has been change is a powerful thing and to be a hopeful one. Um, and now I will hand things back to Lisa. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. That was, I, I love the note that we end on. Um, I love um, how Lydia said that hope is the thing that moves. And I think that like in light of, um, in light of like what everything, in light of everything that's happening in the world, like this was such a great talk to listen to, um, to think about and, you know, think about like in terms of like what the future looks like. And um, yeah, so I do get to ask the last question for tonight. Um, so since we are a bookstore, we all of the audience is curious. Um, any one of you can start, but what are you currently reading or what would you like to suggest to um, people right now? And um, yeah, either whoever um, can start. <laughs> um. I'll start. Uh, okay, oh yeah, or Omar, please. 
Oh, okay. Well, I here, I, let me pick up the book. Um, I felt this was a thematically appropriate book for the evening. I've been reading Leah Thomas's The Intersectional Environmentalist. Um, this book just very recently came out and um, the, the subtitle is How to Dismantle Systems of Oppression to Protect People and Planet. And what's so um, fabulous about this book is that, you know, the environmental movement, um, you know, at least as it existed as in, in this country, has largely been driven by um, the people who look like me. And um, what this book does is it says, well, as an environmentalist, you know, what happens if we center more marginalized communities within that movement? Um, you know, what does that look like? What does action look like? What does the thinking around action look like? Um, and it's just, it's such a valuable tool for all people of all backgrounds to really just think about what role they can play to make a true difference, um, especially for communities that are hit first and hardest by the climate crisis. Um, so the last thing that knocked me on my ass was uh, The Haunting of Haji Hotek um, by, I want to say, Jamil Jan Kochai. I apologize if I'm completely butchering that name. Um, Afghan-American writer. Um, uh, wrote, uh, um, I think, 99 Days in Logar was, was the previous book. But this, The Haunting of Haji Hotek is uh, a collection of short stories I think it comes out next month, I want to say, but relatively soon. And um, it's this absurdist, often absurdist, surrealist stories of um, mostly uh, Afghan immigrants, uh, but, but not exclusively. But the sort of stories are like this one guy is, is an Afghan immigrant living in, in the U.S. and runs to GameStop to pick up a new video game. Um, that's set in an open world setting in Afghanistan. And it's one of those shoot everybody type of games. And then he finds his own relatives are non-playable characters in the thing. Another story has a family whose, whose son is kidnapped in Kabul, I believe, and is returned to them in pieces. And they start stitching him back together. Um, it's, it's unlike anything I've read in a long time. And it's um, just one of the most beautiful collections it doesn't deal with this directly, but in an indirect way about the absurdity of, of America's relationship with the rest of the world and the people it considers disposable. Uh, just really, really original and beautifully written uh, short stories. So that's, that's what's on my radar right now. I am presently reading Girlhood by Melissa Phoebos. Um, I came to her work via her recent craft book um, published by Catapult called Body Work, The Radical Power of Personal Narrative. Um, and have just been sort of working my way through her back catalog. Um, and Girlhood is a, a blend of memoir, criticism, reportage um, about the just insidious internalized narratives of um, a period in, in young women's lives that has not been treated this way before. It's excellent. I'm, I'm totally bowled over by it. Um, I don't, I'm sure, I think we're a little over now, but I'll just quickly say that I'm reading this, which is a really, um, it's called Treeline, uh, and it's really tough. It's really tough to read because it's really sad, but about sort of um, the boreal forests, which are like the largest carbon sink. It's nonfiction, obviously, um, the largest sort of carbon sink that we have and uh, how they're, how they're faring and how the, how the, tree species there are, um, I don't know, it's just, it's pretty devastating actually. Um, so I can only read it in little bits. You know, sometimes you have to take a break from the heavy stuff. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing what's on your bedside table right now. And um, yeah, well, once again, we would like to thank everyone here for joining us on this summer evening. To our audience, your patronage is what enables us to bring you amazing, amazing conversations like this. Um, please continue to support the essential and timely work that these authors bring, as well as PNP, by using the link in the chat to purchase The World As We Knew It, Dispatches from a Changing Climate. And there. And um, don't forget to check our website for more events as we have a great list to choose from, both virtual and in person. And we hope to see you all there. Um, 
Haja, Amy, Lydia, Omar, thank you for spending your Friday night with us. Thank you for sharing your insight, your knowledge, your words. Um, it was just such an honor to be in your virtual presence this evening. And it was just such a pleasure hearing from all of you. So everyone else here, have a good rest of your Friday night and stay strong, stay safe and stay well read. We will see you all next time. Good night.